Welcome to Inspiring Heartfelt Conversations, presented by Anne Autumn's Cocoon, in which we explore a range of end-of-life topics with noted professionals. My name is Barbara Morningstar. Today, I'm excited to have as my guest, Dr. Bruce Grayson. His book titled After, A Doctor Explores What Near-Death Experiences Reveal About Life and Beyond, was recently released and draws on his close to 50 years of research in the field. Welcome, Bruce. Thank you, Barbara. I've been looking forward to talking to you for a long time. Yes, and I've been looking forward to this as well. So we're going to go right into it and begin at the beginning. Um, what initially made you curious about these near-death experiences? Oh, gosh. Well, I was raised in a materialistic scientific household where we never thought about anything spiritual or religious. As far as we knew, the, the physical world was all there is. And when you die, that's the end. And that seemed fine with me. That's just the way life was. So I went through college and medical school with that mindset. And then in the first few weeks of my psychiatric training, I was asked to see a patient in the emergency room who had overdosed. So I went down to see her and she was unconscious. Uh, she could not be aroused. So I, I talked to her roommate who had brought her in, in a, a room about uh, 50 yards down the hall and then went back to see the patient again and she was still out cold. So she was admitted to the intensive care unit overnight. And I went to see her there the next morning when she awoke. Uh, she was still very, very drowsy, could barely open her eyes. And I started to introduce myself and she stopped me and said, I know who you are. I remember you from last night. And that kind of startled me. So I, I said, uh, um, gee, I'm surprised. I thought you were out cold when I saw you last night. And then she looked me in the eye for the first time and said, not in my room. I saw you talking to my roommate down the hall. Mm. That just blew me away. I couldn't, couldn't imagine what she was talking about. Uh, she was talking as if she had left her body and followed me down the hall. And as far as I could tell, I was my body. How can you leave? <laughs> it made no sense at all. So she saw that I was uh, kind of stumbling with this and then went on to tell me about the conversation I had with her roommate, what we were wearing, where we were sitting, all my questions and her answers. And it just it made no sense at all to me. Mm -hmm. But I had to, you know, I was there to do a job with her. So I, I kind of pushed my feelings aside and, and tried to focus on, on her issues, her suicidal thoughts and so forth. And then in the, in the days that followed, as I tried to reflect on this, I, I just didn't make any sense to me. So I, I tried to tell myself it was a trick of some kind. <sighs> Maybe the nurses were trying to fool me. I was a young green intern and it just didn't make any sense. And then about four years, four or five years later, Raymond Moody wrote a book called Life After Life in which he gave us the term near-death experience and described what they were like. And it occurred to me for the first time that this thing that, that this patient had talked to me about was not just a one-time thing, but it was part of a huge phenomenon that people all over the world were having. It still made no sense to me. I couldn't understand it, but that made me go towards it. You know, as a scientist, my job was to understand things. Mm -hmm. And you make the greatest advances in science by trying to study things you don't understand at all. And this was certainly one of them. So I, I started collecting cases and uh, trying to understand it. And here I am 50 years later, still trying to understand it. Mm. Um, it's beautiful to see how it sort of led you into a life's body of work. Yeah. And the University of Virginia, we touched on it just before we started recording, such a unique department. With the kind of reflection of an exploration with children and their sensitivities and people at yeah. end of life too. Yeah. Slightly more than 50 years ago, Mm -hmm. um, Chester Carlson, who invented the Xerox process, gave the university a huge bequest to start this division mm -hmm. to study uh, the possibility that something may survive bodily death. Mm -hmm. And Ian Stevenson became the first director of that group. And he was focused more mainly on um, young children, preschool children, who claimed to remember past lives. And he eventually collected some 2,500 of these kids who gave information that could be verified about their, their past lives. And of course, I was working with uh, near-death experiences in this division, and other people who worked with other uh, phenomena that related to the mind-brain issue. 
and suggesting that the mind was something other than just what the brain does. Mm -hmm. And in fact, may survive after the brain stops doing its thing. Mm -hmm. Well, so beautiful because the sensitivity of children is so oh. enlivened at young ages. And as in the work I do in hospice, we see that sensitivity open in a different yes. way as yes. people near death, right? Yeah, yeah. Well. It's like we have this shell that we build up around us as we, quote, mature, and it sort of walls off all the spiritual realm that the children are aware of. And then as you approach death at the end, it's like that, that wall starts crumbling again, mm. and you once again become sensitive to this other realm. Mm. So that leads beautifully into my next question about perspective. Yes. Um, can you speak to the way perspective is different when individuals are in the midst of the experience? Mm. Well, uh, of course, in the midst of a near-death experience, you're really not relating to this world very much mm. at all. Now, many people will start by leaving their bodies and looking down from an out-of-body perspective. In fact, many of them are, are startled to see this, since their, their bodies down there and are puzzled by it. Some don't even recognize it for a while. Mm. But they quickly become distracted by other things that seem much more important to them. The, what we now call the spiritual realm, for lack of a better world, word. Um, they get a sense of something much larger than themselves. Now, many of them talk about a, a warm, loving being of light that radiates unconditional love. And then they will re review their lives often, uh, see deceased loved ones, um, come to some assessment of their own lives uh, as they go through the life review. Um, they almost never talk about being judged by some other entity, mm -hmm. but they talk about judging themselves and deciding what was meaningful and, and fulfilling in their lives and what wasn't. Um, and this is something that we often do with, with patients who are facing the end of life. We guide them through a life review to sort of help them reach perspective on what, what their life was, was worth and, and uh, what was more, most valuable about it. But people do it spontaneously in a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And when they come back from the NDE, of course, the near-death experience, they use that, that information to sort of make a course correction in their lives and point in a more, more fulfilling direction than they had been going before. So can you expand a little bit on the life review? I found it fascinating mm -hmm. listening. I did the audio version of the book about yeah, yeah. experiencing both sides of that is quite profound. Yes. Can you expand on that? Yeah, yeah. Maybe uh, 30 or 40% of people who have a near-death experience will report a life review in which they see virtually everything in their lives uh, in a matter of seconds from our perspective, and it's you know, eternity from their perspective. There's no sense of time in the near death experience. Um, but many of them report seeing and reliving the experience, not only through their own eyes, but through the eyes of other people involved in the scenes. Uh, for example, uh, one fellow, Tom Sawyer, was a, uh, uh, a laborer who had a near death experience in his 30s when a truck he was working underneath fell and crushed his chest. And in that near-death experience, he reviewed his entire life. And he re reviewed it not only from his own perspective, but through the eyes of other people as well. An example was he remembered an incident when he was a teenager and driving his new truck down the road and a drunk man happened to wander out in front of him and almost hit his truck. And Tom was furious because he almost dented his truck. Uh, so he stopped the, the truck and rolled down the window and started yelling at the man. And the man, being intoxicated, um, reached his arm in the truck window and slapped Tom across the face. And that was just too much for this uh, hot-headed teenager. <laughs> he got out of the truck and started beating the man mercilessly and left him a bloody mess on the median divider and then got back in his truck and drove away. <laughs> well, when he had his near-death experience... He relived this through his own eyes, feeling the adrenaline rush and the rage, but also through the eyes of the drunk man. And he felt that man's humiliation at being beaten by this little teenager. He felt his nose getting bloodier. He felt his teeth going through his lower lip. Mm. Uh, and he just felt everything through 
that man's eyes as well as Steve's own. And when he came back from the near death experience, he felt uh, without any, any question that we are all interconnected. Mm-hmm. And what you do to someone else, you do to yourself. When you hurt mm-hmm. someone else, you're hurting yourself. When you help other people, you're helping yourself. And, you know, one after another, near death experience, it tells me, yes, it is the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have them do unto yourself, unto, unto, as you have them do unto you. But for them, it's no longer a guideline hmm. they're supposed to follow. They understand it now as the law of nature, like, mm-hmm. like gravity. Mm-hmm. That's just the way things are. The way you treat other people is the way you yourself are treating yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's mm-hmm. tremendously powerful. Mm-hmm. Well, and so, so the beauty of it, too, seeing that there's no judgment in this, just sort of no. a realization yeah. of a responsibility around the act and the impact of it on the individuals right. that are in right. the midst of it. Yeah. Um, so suicide, that was interesting too. You know, you see, you hear about all these beautiful worlds and then these people have completed suicide to try and right. get away from here. You yeah. think, oh, when they come back, they're going to do it again. Exactly, exactly. You know, when I first started hearing uh, from near-death experiencer after near-death experiencer that what happens after death is, is beautiful and wonderful, I started worrying that, you know, as a psychiatrist, we're going to make people more suicidal by telling them this. Um, so I did a study and I, I interviewed everyone who was admitted to my hospital after a suicide attempt. And I compared those who had a near-death experience as a result of the suicide attempt with those who didn't. And what we found to our surprise was that those who had a near-death experience were much less suicidal than those who didn't have an NDE, which certainly seemed counterintuitive. I had known lots of people who were thinking of ending their lives, but were deterred because they were afraid what might happen. And if you take away the fear of death, what's to stop them? Mm-hmm. But the near death experience has told me that when you lose your fear of dying, you also lose your fear of living. Mm-hmm. Since you're not afraid of losing your life, there's nothing holding you back from jumping in with both feet, taking risks, you know, taking chances and enjoying life to the fullest, mm-hmm. uh, which gives you a life that's much more meaningful and fulfilling than you had before. Mm-hmm. You still have the same problems but now they see them as learning opportunities. They understand that they are part of something greater than themselves and their own personal problems are seen in a different perspective now. Mm -hmm. Well, I shared with you that beautiful, um, someone referenced this years ago, Turn of the Carpet, this old song and poem from the 1700s about two weavers. And such a beautiful metaphor, if anyone gets a chance to look up that poem. Yes. yes. About how we don't, in the entanglement of the human side, we don't get to see that higher view, but the intricacy and the delicacy and the perfection of the weave of the carpet in the tapestry is breathtaking, you know, from that higher perspective. Yeah. And many near-death experiences will say that when they were in the NDE, They got to see things from the other side of the carpet. Mm. And they saw the beauty in things that look random to us here. And when they come back, they may not remember or understand everything they saw, but they remember that it did make sense on the other side. Mm. Um, And uh, they remember that there was a meaning and purpose to everything. Mm. Now, Anita Morjani gives them the metaphor of uh, living in a dark warehouse where you can't see anything, but you have a flashlight. And you can shine the flashlight around and see things here and there. And then all of a sudden, someone turns on the light in the warehouse. And you see row after row after row of of stuff that you didn't even know was there. Mm. And then the light's turned off again. And there you're back in the darkness with your little flashlight. And you can't see those things, but you remember that they're all there. Mm. That's what NDEers are like. Mm -hmm. They've seen it from the other perspective. And even though they can't see it now, they know it's there. Mm. Okay. So language, (laughs) what um, type of language do people Mm. use to try to explain these experiences? Well, almost every near-death experiencer says, when you ask them, tell me about your NDE, they say, I I can't, you know, there are no words for it. You know, words Mm. can't describe what I went through. 
So of course we researchers say, that's great. Tell me about it. You know, <laughs> so, so we know that we're making them distort the experience by putting it into words. Mm. So they end up using metaphors mm. and most of the metaphors are uh, from their religion or from their culture. Uh, so that introduces some cross-cultural variation in what people say to us, uh, but not in the experience itself. For example, people describe, describe this warm, loving being of light all over the world, and they have been doing this for centuries. Uh, we have accounts from ancient Greece and Rome that sound just like NDEs we have today. But people in the U.S. and Canada who are raised in a Christian society well, may, may, may call that being of light God or Christ, and you don't hear people from Hindu Buddhist cultures using that word. Uh, but even here, many people will say, you know, I'm going to call it God. So you know what I'm talking about. But this wasn't the God I was taught about in church. This is much bigger than that. Um, but they have to use some word for it. So they use the, the religious or cultural metaphors for it. And they know that that's not what it really is. And they tell us that's not what it really is either. Um, so they're all using metaphors the way people who are um, facing their own end of life will use uh-huh. metaphors to describe uh, the trip they're about to take. Uh-huh. Yeah, we see that all the time. It's beautiful. It's very poetic, and it can yes. be drawn on the life experiences. And if you're not attuned to the metaphor, you can yeah. miss a lot of things, right? Right, right. So. That's beautiful. So how about within the experience itself? Are words used to communicate when people are in the exchange within the near-death experience? Well, it's funny because we don't talk to them in the ND. We talk to them when they're back here. And once they're back here, they they have to use words to communicate with us. Right. They often say, you know, it wasn't words. Um, Nobody was talking. We just sort of, it was a mind-to-mind communication. We understood Mm -hmm. each other perfectly. And if I thought a question, I would get the answer. Mm. And it would be just in my mind. And I don't know how it got there. Mm. And yet when they talk to us, they have to put it in words. And so that's what they do. And knowing that that's oversimplifying things for us. Mm-hmm. You know, an example is, is they almost always say that the other realm is timeless. Mm. There's just no sense of time over there. It's as if everything's happening all at once and happening forever. Um, and yet when they tell us about the NDE, the near death experience, they tell it as if, if it's, if, as if it's a sequence of events, this happened and then this happened and then this happened. Um, but you can't have a sequence of events without time passing. Mm. And when I ask them about that, they say, well, it's a paradox. When I describe it to you now, mm. but over there, it wasn't a paradox at all. It made perfect sense. Mm-hmm. But just back here in this realm where we have this, man-made imposition of, of, of linear time, uh, it doesn't really make sense anymore. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you've been immersed in this for, for decades now, but as a scientist with a very literal, mm. logical way of approaching things, what was it like for you to initially step into this world of metaphors and the unseen or undefinable? Yeah. Well, when, when I started off, I was a materialist, and I assumed we were going to find the physiological mechanism by which these illusions and hallucinations occurred. Mm. But as a psychiatrist, you know, I know very well what uh, psychosis is, what illusions are, what hallucinations are, and these were a totally different category of experience. These you were mean not. It, you mean in the tone and quality of it? Like, how do you mean a, a differentiation? Almost every way you look at it, they're, they're different. The, the mm. context in which they occur, mm. uh, these are normal, healthy, high-functioning people who have this bizarre experience that doesn't fit in their lives. Mm. Uh, the content is very different from, from psychotic symptoms. For example, uh, there's consistency, not only between individuals, but across cultures and across centuries. Uh, the NDE is basically the same um, no matter where it occurs. And yet psychotic hallucinations are very idiosyncratic from one person Mm. to another. You don't hear people telling about the same hallucinations. Mm. They're all different. Mm. Uh, There's a a patterning and a a sequencing to the NDE that you don't see in psychotic hallucinations. Mm. Um, And the way they're remembered is very different. 
Uh, hallucinations like dreams fade fairly quickly. I couldn't tell you a dream I had 40 years ago. Mm-hmm. But people who have a near-death experience never forget them. They're the same decades later as they were today. And in fact, I was able to do that since I've been doing this research for half a century now. I was able to go back and track down people I interviewed 40 years ago and have them describe their NDE to me again now. And we found that there was absolutely no difference in what they said 30, 40 years ago and what they say now about it. Mm -hmm. So unlike all our other memories, memories of NDEs do not fade over time. Mm -hmm. But the most most important difference to me between near-death experiences and other spiritual experiences and hallucinations is the way they change people's lives. Mm. People come back from a near-death experience transformed. Their attitudes, beliefs, values, behavior are totally different. And I don't know any other phenomenon that can produce this amount of change. And I'll make my living by trying to help people make changes in their lives. And it's very difficult work um, and takes a long time. And here you have in the near-death experience something that takes place in a matter of seconds or at the most minutes, and it totally transforms people people for for decades. Mm -hmm. Uh, They become much more spiritual, much more compassionate, much more caring, altruistic, and they become much less interested in things of this world, material Mm -hmm. possessions, uh, power, prestige, fame, competition. Um, What matters to them now are relationships and the quality of how we relate to other people and to the divine. Mm. So is the integration back in always a smooth one? Not at all. (laughs) (laughs) It depends on what your life was like beforehand. Mm. If you were kind of a spiritual person before, that just confirms everything you thought. Mm. But, uh, you know, here in the Western Hemisphere, very few of us are like that. Mm. Um, We live in a competitive materialistic world, and that poses problems. Um, You know, I've talked to people who were career policemen or military officers who were, had a near-death experience and were totally transformed. One fellow I knew was a, uh, a Marine sergeant in Vietnam and was shot in the chest and he had uh, shrapnel all over his lungs. And he was air to to Philipp- the Philippines to a hospital. And during the operation to clear his lungs out, he had a near-death experience, a very elaborate one. And when he woke up from that, he realized that we are all in this together. We're all the same. And shooting someone else was just absurd to him. That meant, you know, shooting yourself, basically. Mm -hmm. Uh, But he was, after rehab, he was sent back into the field, into the jungle, and quickly realized he just could not shoot his gun. Mm -hmm. And he had to leave the Marines, which had been his lifelong career, Mm -hmm. and came back to the States and and retrained as a medical technician. I've heard Mm -hmm. this from police officers, um, I, one person I knew was a, uh, a career criminal who was transformed by his near-death experience. I've talked to people who were in cutthroat businesses who came back from an NDE thinking that getting ahead at someone else's expense uh, just makes no sense at all anymore. Mm-hmm. Since, you know, you hurt someone else and you're hurting yourself. And many of them leave the business world and go into helping professions, uh, social work, uh, healthcare, clergy, and so forth. Uh, But many will stay in the business, but just change the way they do it Mm -hmm. and treat their customers and their competitors and their employees much more compassionately. Mm -hmm. Well, and would you say that's because, and I don't want to put any work, but in the life review, the way it's described, they're not just experiencing their side, but they're receiving the act of what they give into a depth that has a profound impact. Right. Well, the, the life review where you empathically feel what you're doing uh, to other people um, certainly makes it concrete for a lot of them. Mm-hmm. But even those who don't have a life review, just feeling the unconditional love from the divine, whatever that source is, that alone really transforms them. It makes them aware that um, deserved or not, we are all loved and we all have the divine in us. And that makes them treat people differently when they come back. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about the sensory experiences. Because the sensory experiences, well, I'm not going to say it. So how does that enliven in these experiences and how they describe it to you? Yeah, yeah. 
Now, again, we get stuck with, with the problems that there are no words to describe it. Mm. Um, and they will say that their senses, you know, vision, hearing, touch, and so forth, are much more intense, much more vivid than they are in everyday life. They say things like that world was hyper real. It was more real than this physical world is. They see colors they've never seen before. They hear sounds they've never heard before. Mm -hmm. And when they try to come back and talk about it, they fail. Mm -hmm. And some will, in fact, turn to nonverbal ways of expressing it. They will try painting or trying writing music mm -hmm. to try to convey what they, what they went through. Um, I've also known people who had hearing deficits who heard perfectly in the near-death experience. Um, Ken Ring has done a study of people who were uh, born blind who had near-death experiences and could see in the NDE. Um, so it's as if your senses become heightened in the NDE. Now, again, we run into problems with words hmm. because people will say, you know, the blind people will say, yeah, I saw that he was wearing a, a red tie and it was you know, really beautiful. But, you know, they say, well, I didn't literally see it. I mean, I don't have eyes, mm -hmm. but I knew it. Mm -hmm. And the only way I can describe it is to say I, I saw it. So you can come up with this problem that there are no words to describe what they experience. What they experience as their sensory experiences are much more vivid than what we experience through our eyes and ears and skin. Mm -hmm. I remember working with a woman on the palliative unit. She was younger, coming near the end of her life. And one day she just expressed to me this music she could hear. Ah. And she, her background was Christian. And she said they, she had the same challenge. She said, they're like the hymns from my childhood, Barb. But she said, they have a quality and a tone in the sound. I can't even begin to explain to you. And she said, when people were out of the room, it, like, it was like it filled the room. Um, and then when people came, it was like the radio turned down a bit so she could <laughs> engage. And, and I said to her, well, how does it make you feel? And she said, oh, it's so beautiful. Now, I couldn't hear the music. Right. But it was so profound for her. Who was I to take that away? Yeah. yeah. Other than celebrate. And she talked about hearing that until the day she died. Right. So even coming close in hospice work yeah. at near yeah. end of life, you he, hear them i'm doing this because it's the yeah, senses yeah. you know the sound the taste the smells it's just a diff the, the depth of feeling because that came up in in the research too how deeply things are felt yes yes and of course as you're suggesting here people who don't have near-death experiences but actually go on to die have so-called deathbed visions which are mm -hmm. very very similar to near-death experiences mm -hmm. and they will talk about being greeted by deceased loved ones uh, that we don't see, but they're obviously responding to something. Mm -hmm. Well, I recently did a, an interview with Dr. Christopher Kerr, who's mm -hmm. at Buffalo Hospice in New York, and they're doing extensive research on yes. deathbed visions yes. and dreams. And even for, for me, I mean, at medical rounds, if the patient started seeing a loved one, clearly who was coming to greet them who died, we go, are, are they getting ready? Like, you know, we talk about it in medical rounds because it would happen so often, you know, and, and you go into a section on that as well about initially yeah. going, okay, well, hmm, what about, is that kind of a hallucination or what's right, the right, right. truth that. I think these are, these are, you know, to meeting deceased loved ones is very easy for uh, debunkers to, to wish away as saying, well, it's expectation. You think you're dying, so of course you want to be greeted by loved ones, so you imagine that they're there to greet you. And that, that, that may be an explanation for some of the cases, you know, who to, who's to say. But there are a number of cases in which the person who is going through this experience encounters deceased loved ones that were not known at the time to be dead. And I wrote a, I wrote a paper about this about 12 years ago with dozens of cases like this from the literature. And there was even one case from ancient Rome. Uh, Pliny the Elder wrote a case about this in the first century, a very detailed one. But uh, one of the ones that I was involved in was a 25-year-old fellow who was admitted to the hospital with um, pneumonia. And he was having repeated respiratory arrests where he couldn't get his breath. And he had one nurse who was his primary nurse about his age. She was 25. 
Um, and they got pretty friendly. And at one point she said to him, I'm going to be taking the long weekend off. So I won't see you for a while. And you'll have other nurses substituting for me. So she took off for the weekend. He said goodbye to her. And that was fine. And over the weekend, he had another respiratory arrest where he had to be resuscitated. And in that arrest, he had a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. And he found himself in a beautiful pastoral scene. And there, to his surprise, was that nurse, Anita, walking towards him. Mm -hmm. uh, so he did a double take and said, you know, Anita, what are you doing here? And she told him, you can't stay here. You need to go back to your body. And I want you to find my parents and tell them I'm so sorry that I wrecked the red MGB. Hmm. And then she turned and walked away. Hmm. When he woke up back in his hospital bed, he had a very clear, clear memory of this whole experience. And he started to tell the first nurse who walked into his room about it. And she got very flustered and just walked out of the room immediately. Hmm. It turned out that this, his favorite nurse had taken the weekend off to celebrate her 21st birthday. And her parents mm -hmm. surprised her with a red MGB for her birthday. She got very excited, jumped in the car, took off for a spin, lost control of the car, smashed into a telephone pole and died instantly, shortly before he had his near-death experience. Mm -hmm. Now, there's no way he could have known that she had died or expected mm -hmm. to see her or wanted to see her. And certainly no way he could have known how she died. Mm -hmm. And yet he did. Mm -hmm. And we have case after case after case of this that are clearly not wishful thinking and expectation, but mm -hmm. seem to be encountering the spirits of the deceased loved ones. Mm -hmm. Well, and bridging too to end of life work. Yes. You know, we hear about, and my father even recently passed and the, the, tr the reality, the sense of realness of my mother who died being around him mm -hmm. was just palatable, like mm -hmm. just really strong. But I remember once being a medical rounds and Again, we're talking about someone nearing death and, the and there'd been a sudden death within the family of this man and nobody wanted to tell him yeah. that the person had died because he was facing his own death. Right. And then the family went in one day and he went, oh, I can't remember the name of it, but Joe showed up last night and came to be, and they all looked at him and they hadn't told him the person had no. died no. and he knew nothing. And then he t the patient talked about the exchange and they all just, you know, it was, it was moving and touching yeah. and profound and out of the scheme yeah. of what they thought the truth yeah. of his knowing was, right? So yeah. it, it's really hard for any of us who hear about these stories not to be profoundly affected by them. Mm -hmm. Okay, so purpose. I want to go into that a little bit more because that seems to come up a lot. Mm -hmm. The person's in the middle of this experience and then they're sent back for a reason. Do they know what the purpose is or they did the, how does that play out yeah. within the experience and coming back? Well, it's variable. Some say they were given a choice and they chose to come back for a certain reason, either to raise their children or to help a loved one pass or something else. Um, and others say they were not given a choice. They were told your work is not finished. It's not your time yet. You need to go back. And some of them are very reluctant to come back and, and they argue when they're sent back. Mm -hmm. um, many of those who come back are aware of what the purpose was, or at least they think they are. Um, but others uh, do not know. They just say, you know, I, I, I was told that there's a purpose and I might have been told what the purpose was, but I can't remember it now that I'm back here. I know there's That's something okay. you're doing back here. So, but, but so if they don't know the detail, is it a deeper, compelling investment yeah. in life, and just even with that awareness, or how does that play out? Well, they're they're um, they strongly believe that there is some purpose they were sent back for, mm -hmm. and it's like it'll be manifested when the time is right, but they can't remember mm -hmm. it now. Mm -hmm. Just sort of going through their lives, trying to live as compassionately as possible and having confidence that at some point it'll become clear to me what I'm doing back here. It'll um, reveal itself. Yeah. Yeah. Fully. I mean, they're, they're looking forward to their eventual death when they will pass over to this other realm again, but they're not in any hurry. They know there's a reason why they're back here and they're mm -hmm. content to play that out and let it happen. Mm-hmm. 
So let's go into some of the more set because we now we're talking about all this beauty and all mm. this amazing, but then there's an arm of people when they have a near death experience, it's not as positive. Can yeah. you talk a little bit more about the ones that are more challenged for people? Sure, sure. You know, when we first started doing this work in the late 1970s and early 1980s, we were relying on people to come forward and tell us about their experience. And all we heard were the beautiful ones, the blissful ones. So we thought that's all there was. And it wasn't until we started broadening our, our, our net and, and, for example, uh, interviewing everyone who was who admitted to the hospital with with a cardiac arrest, that we started hearing some of the unpleasant ones, um, and there certainly are some. Most people who have studied this estimate that between one and five percent of near death experiences are unpleasant or distressing in some way. Mm -hmm. However, uh, we know that's probably an underestimate because these are very hard for people to talk about. Mm -hmm. uh, many people feel. There must be something wrong with me because I didn't have a blissful experience. I had an unpleasant one. Mm. Am I an evil person? Did I do something wrong? Mm. Or they may just feel that they're embarrassed to talk about it. Or it's, um, it's too painful to even think about it. Mm. So they tend not to talk about it. So it's harder to find those cases. Um, we don't know why some people have unpleasant experiences. It's certainly not the case that... Uh, saintly people have blissful experiences and evil people have bad experiences. I've got examples on both sides of the case. And I've got people who were um, in, the, for, in prison for life for murder, who had a heart attack in prison and had a blissful experience. And we know people who have had what have seemed to be saintly lives who have unpleasant experiences. That's not a surprise. We've got accounts from Catholic saints throughout the centuries who we talk about the dark night of the soul, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, St. John of the Cross. Um, and it's like uh, Joseph Campbell talks about the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. where you have to go through this, this series of travails before you finally reach enlightenment. And that may be a part of it, that mm -hmm. you have to struggle with these unpleasant things before you get to the blissful part of the enlightenment. Um, but th there are some sense that your personality may have something to do with this. For example, there's uh, one type of unpleasant experience that seems just like the blissful ones, but they're experienced in a frightening way. People talk about being ripped out of their bodies and thrust down a tunnel at lightning speed and confronted with this blinding light. And they are terrified of that and they're trying to fight it and resist it. And these are generally people who have a hard time in life, not being in control, mm. like being able to control everything. And no matter mm. what happens in an NDE, you are not in control of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so that is a terrifying experience for them and they resist it. And for many of them, when they finally get exhausted and can't fight anymore and they surrender, it suddenly becomes a blissful experience. Mm, that's interesting. So for at least some of these cases, it's mm -hmm. your resistance to the experience that makes it unpleasant, mm -hmm. not the experience itself. Hmm. Interesting. Okay, I want to move into the mechanics of this a little bit more about consciousness, the brain. Mm -hmm. And so how does, in your research, how have you perceived the brain integrating these in yeah. relation to this other picture? Yeah, that's, that's a challenge because obviously the brain is very important to our everyday thinking and perceiving. Uh, when you get intoxicated, you don't think as clearly. And when you get a stroke or hit on the head, that affects your thinking. So it seems as if the brain creates our thoughts and our feelings. Um, but then you have extreme experiences like near-death experiences where the brain seems to be diminished or sometimes totally offline. And yet our thoughts are clearer and faster than ever. And our feelings are more intense than ever. And that should not be if the brain is creating all these thoughts and feelings. So the NDE is a suggestion that the mind is not what the brain does, whether you call it the mind, consciousness, spirit, whatever it is, that part of us that thinks and feels and makes decisions and has urges is not a product of the, of the brain. So what's the brain for? Um, well, there, there are other suggestions. Good that, question. <laughs> yeah, well, good I mean, question. <laughs> we've been struggling with this for, for a long, long time. 2,000 years ago, 
Hippocrates wrote that the brain is the interpreter of the mind or the messenger of the mind. And he said that, you know, the mind is somewhere out there and the brain receives thoughts and interprets them so the body can understand it. Mm -hmm. Kind of like a television set will receive signals from somewhere outside and convert them into sights and sounds that we can appreciate. And it's not just a receiver, it's a filter. There are lots of television stations out there. And if you had signals from all of them at the same time, you couldn't sort them out and make sense out of them all. But the TV set will select one channel and then filter out all the others. And just let the one in so you can then appreciate it. And the thought is that the brain is somehow a filter for the mind. And it lets in only those limited thoughts and feelings that are relevant to us. So what's relevant? The brain, like the rest of our body, evolved to help us negotiate the physical world. Your eyes receive light from the outside and only transmit to us a very small portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that's relevant to our survival. Similarly, our ears don't hear sounds that other animals do. Uh, they just have a small range of frequency that they, they, they respond to. Mm. So it makes sense that the brain would also do this. It would filter out those thoughts and feelings that aren't relevant to survival in the physical realm, that don't help us find food and shelter and a mate and so forth. And you don't need to talk to spirits to do those things. You don't need to see deceased loved ones. You don't need to see a, de a deity. You just need to know where's the food, where's the shelter, and so forth. <laughs> so your brain evolved to filter out those irrelevant thoughts and just let in the ones that are physically important to us. Mm. There's evidence for this, not only from NDEs, but from other phenomena as well. For example, there's something called temporal lucidity or mm. terminal lucidity. Uh, people who are nearing death who have been demented for years and years and can no longer communicate or recognize loved ones may suddenly become completely lucid mm. in the hours or sometimes days before they die. Mm. And there is no medical explanation for how this can happen. People with Alzheimer's disease cannot regenerate brain cells afterwards. Um, it just, we don't know how it happens, but somehow uh, when the brain decompensates, uh, degenerates enough, the mind can then flourish again. Mm. Likewise, we have imaging, neuroimaging of psychedelic drug trips that was done in the last uh, decade or so. We used to think that psychedelic drugs uh, produce hallucinations by stimulating the brain to hallucinate. And what we find is that the more elaborate mystical experiences with psychedelic drugs are accompanied by a decrease in brain activity. The electric mm -hmm. activity goes down and the coordination across different parts of the brain goes down. Mm -hmm. So again, it's like when the brain is knocked out, or at least the filtering part of the brain is knocked out, the mind can experience all sorts of things that it couldn't otherwise. Mm -hmm. So we suspect that one metaphor for how the brain works with the mind is that it's a filter of some kind, mm -hmm. um, that it somehow filters out those, quote, irrelevant things like God, mm -hmm. uh, and just lets in the things that are important to us as a physical animal. Mm -hmm. now, again, this is a metaphor uh, it's not a literal description of what the brain's doing. It's a metaphor for it, an analogy. And there are people who are working on uh, what parts of the brain, what neuroanatomical and neurochemical processes in the brain might be doing this filtering function. Hmm. I had an, just thinking of it, Alzheimer's, I had the opposite experience with my mother who had it for 12 years. She I'm on the west coast of Canada and my father and, and she came years ago for a visit and she was just in the beginning stages of dementia. And I was at my sister's place on the island and everyone left the, we're in other parts of the house. And at one point my mother looked me straight in the eye and she said, this is the last time you're going to see me. Wow. And I said, okay. And then she looked me straight in the eye and said, will you visit me? And I said, yes. And she said, good, I would like that. And I said, later, will you come to me in a dream and let me know you're okay? And she said, yes. Oh. And, when she, and so I just held it 
like I could feel some kind of truth was coming through. And then they went back east and I didn't see her until about a year later. And I could not have the same conversation with her. Her dementia had progressed and I wasn't a, so there was a a profound moment there of a knowing and she was preparing for me that we would Mm. not be able to engage in the same way. It was quite interesting. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So the Dalai Lama, (laughs) you got to meet the Dalai Lama. Can you tell me about that experience and why that invitation occurred? Now, this uh, current Dalai Lama is, is quite a unique person. He's always been fascinated by Western science from the time he was a child. Mm-hmm. And in the last uh, probably 15 years, um, he's led a program that he calls Science for Monks. Um, <laughs> you know, their, their educational program for, for becoming a monk is like getting a PhD uh, here in the West. It, it takes about f- 15 years of education to, to reach that. But there is no a part of what we call Western science in their training. And he realized that this is a great lack in their education. So we started bringing over Western scientists uh, 15 years ago. So every year to have a, uh, a seminar for them to talk about Western science, astronomy, uh, physics, geology, everything. And a few years ago, I got to be a part of that. Um, mm-hmm. And we were talking about the mind and the brain and consciousness um, And it was a kind of a dialogue between Western scientists such as myself and the Buddhist monks. It was an interesting experience for me because when I talk to Western uh, audiences, I often have to start talking about what is a near-death experience because many people don't understand. And with these monks, they knew all about it. Hmm. Now that when it came time for the question and answer period, their questions were all, let me tell you about my aunt's experience or my sister's experience or something like this. Mm-hmm. They were very mm-hmm. familiar with all of it. Mm-hmm. But what struck me most was my interaction with the Dalai Lama himself. Mm. He was talking about how both Buddhism and Western science are empirical uh, disciplines, that we all look for the data, the physical evidence. And he said that comes primary in both Western science and in Buddhism. Mm. In Western science, if you have data that aren't consistent with your theories, like near-death experiences, you have to revise the theory because the data aren't challenged. And he Mm -hmm. said the same thing in Buddhism. If we find some facts that contradict our beliefs, we have to change the beliefs. Mm -hmm. But he said the difference between Western science and Buddhism is why you're doing this. Western science tries to understand the world in order to control it or manipulate it. Mm. Whereas Buddhists try to understand the world in order to live more harmoniously in it with it. Mm, it's beautiful. It, it certainly changed my thinking about why I do research. Mm. Mm. And you know, I don't, no longer go into it. When I start a research project, I don't think about what can I learn about the mechanisms here, but how is this going to help humanity? If I do this research, how is it going to help people? And if I can't answer that, it's not a study worth doing. Mm -hmm. So we're coming close to the end. So on and bridging into that, the the title of after, you explain sort of Mm -hmm. the different perspectives of after. Can you elaborate on, on the extension of that title? Right, right. Well, most people think it refers, of course, to what happens after death. And it does to some extent. Uh, We certainly learn a lot about what may happen after death from near-death experiences. But most near-death experiencers say that what's most important to them is what they learned about this life, not the other life. Mm -hmm. So after refers to what happens after a near-death experience when you come back and have to live in this world. Mm -hmm. But I also wanted to refer to what happens to the readers, to us, Mm -hmm. after we read the book. Um, Mm -hmm. There's lots of evidence now that just learning about near-death experiences can produce some of the same changes of an NDE. It can make people more compassionate, more caring, more altruistic. There have been a number of studies done with college students who take a class in near-death experiences, and they become much more altruistic in their behavior after the class is over. 
And this has been demonstrated in follow-up studies a year or two after the class is over. Mm-hmm. They're, uh, they're per- per- persistent changes. People become much more compassionate after learning about NDEs. So my hope was that in writing this book and letting people learn about near-death experiences, some of it may rub off on them as well. Mm-hmm. Well, I know for me, reading or listening to the book, reading, of course, we, we had an engagement prior just because of my work and, and research, but there were two arms to it. There was the, the beautiful parallel of, of so many of the themes in the near-death mm-hmm. experience we see at the bedside, like yes. um, the sense of reality, meeting of the deceased, the language changing, but the pervasive element of love and the sensory experience is shifting to a deeper place, right? Mm-hmm. And then on a personal level, oh, I felt like I had a whole life review <laughs> because it, I, I lost a friend to a, a very cha- sad choice of suicide at a young age. And then later, not at a near-death experience or end of life, had a breakthrough dream that was as lucid as a near-death experience with light and sound and her presence. And, and when I came out of that, because I was struggling with the grief, there was just this whole different sense of a direction. And I made a firm decision and intent to follow my heart. Mm-hmm. And so all the way through listening to the book, I was having tears thinking, oh my, you know, Robert Frost poem. Yes. <laughs> Two roads diverge in the woods. Yes, yes. And I took the road less traveled by. And that has made all the difference because it led me to do this beautiful work in end of life care, right? So thank you for that. Yeah, you know, we, so, as I said, we we talk about the near death experience as if it's a fairly discreet and unique experience, but it's, it's only one of many ways of getting, getting there to this, this other realization. And there are lots of ways of reaching a spiritual enlightenment other than going through a near-death state. That just happens to be one of the most reliable ways in our culture. Mm-hmm. Um, but there are lots, lots of other ways of, of getting this. Mm-hmm. So now I'm getting all choked up here. But anyway, so last thing I want to ask you, because you, as you said, at the beginning, you were this from this materialistic family, a scientist, and... I always like to ask the guest how their heart has been changed. Love seems to be the main theme it is, in yeah. most of these experiences. So how has your heart been changed yeah. Yeah, well, by yeah. doing this work? I, I, I'm still a scientist and I love looking at the material part of the world and, and trying to figure things out. But it's, it's, it's very clear to me now after doing this work that that's not the important part of life, not the important part of why we're here and what we're doing, that what really matters is the heart and how you relate to other people, how you relate to the universe, to the divine. Uh, and that's, you know, that's really the understanding of that is understanding of, of why we're here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the material world is like a vehicle for us, uh, but it's not, it's not us and it's not why we're here. Mm-hmm. Why are we here? I don't know. I mean, there's, there's got to be some reason why we're here in the material world. <laughs> but what's important to us is the part that persists after the material world ends for us. Hmm. And there is abundant evidence now that we don't die when the body dies. And that part of us that persists after the body dies is with us right here, right now. And if you can connect with that, that's the key to what's going on with us really. And as you said, it's, it well, often boils down to love. Hmm. Hmm. Well, I thank you so much for coming on as my guest today. I mean, I just, I, the International Association of Near-Death Experience is an organization you helped launch. And a month or so ago, they had a tribute to you around mm-hmm. the book. And I heard all these people coming on and thanking you and The biggest thing I I heard from people was the gratitude for your openness and curiosity, but also that you created a safe space for people to share that. And I don't know you as intimately as many of those do, but in the interaction that I've had with you, 
I just want to thank you for that as well, for your generosity in sharing the research, but also when I've shared things, how safe you've made it feel um, to explore that and express it, because that's rare. I try to do that in my work yeah. when things like this come up. And it's rare, but it's beautiful when you feel yeah. that sense of trust, right? So, so thank you for that. Thank you. And thank you, Barbara, for letting me have this opportunity to talk with you. This has mm. been uh, really, really fun. Mm. So for everyone listening again, he's got it behind him on the shelf there, the <laughs> book after. It's a lovely book and it's got a perfect balance of the research and the grounding elements of the scientific research and the flow and expression of the heart and the stories. So thank you so much again, Bruce, for coming on today. I really appreciate this thank conversation. You. It's been my pleasure. Thank you. Okay. You take care. <laughs>